The prefrontal cortex is this area right behind your forehead and it has to do with attention, concentration, judgment, impulse control, forethought. And forethought is really important to recovering addicts because forethought is that ability to think things through before you say them or do them. You know, it's not best just to say whatever comes to your mind or do whatever comes to your mind. And in God's eyes, we're all equal opportunity acts, if you ask me. It doesn't matter if it's porn, drugs, alcohol, food, money, uh, whatever, controlling people. You know, all of those things are wrong and they hurt our relationships with God within ourselves and other people. I was researched probably seven, eight years ago now at University of San Diego where they're doing a study on uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, where they had EEG, wires, a whole bunch of wires they put to the brain to measure brainwave activity and so on. And they had one person they found out had kind of an unusual response. And they went to her and they asked her what was going on with her. And what they found out was that she was praying during the study. And so then they did a study on prayer and they found there's a cluster of nerves in the right temporal lobe that will balance out under prayer. It's like, I mean, it'll be good blood flow, good perfusion there. And uh, in neuroscience, they now call that uh, the God spot. And so it's actually hard, hardwired for a relationship with God, which is really cool. And the research since then has only expanded on that. It's been really very exciting. When you uh, balance that out with you know, nutrition, uh, could be supplements, could be the right medication, exercise, and so on, then that means there's going to be more even blood flow there, and then you're going to be able to experience uh, things, life a little bit more deeply, a little bit more passionately, whether it's your relationship with God, within yourself, and other people. The brain is a, has the consistency of tofu, and the only cushioning in there is membranes and fluid inside a hard, bony structure. So if I put, slap my hands together like this, that's literally the only blow it takes to the head uh, to cause some bruising. You know, that's why in um, the field of psychology and social worker and actually pastors and teachers are mandated to report child abuse. You know, it's absolutely wrong for any child to be slapped, you know, in the face and hit abusively like that. Because literally it's gonna, can change their whole life. I've had clients where they were knocked out by a parent going into rage and hitting them. And so if that head gets hit, then what happens, the brain is literally gonna bounce around in there and there's gonna be injury to the frontal cortex, injury to the sides of the brain. So one of the very first things is for brain health is protect your brain. You know, um, Research at the University of, I think it's Southern Florida, uh, of college freshmen who've been playing soccer uh, from childhood all the way up to high school found increased attention deficit disorder just from the trauma of hitting that on the head. Uh, it doesn't take much. So what we now know, 10 years of alcohol and or drug use, and that includes marijuana, increases the risk of early dementia four times. Anybody who's been smoking marijuana uh, with any consistency has now increased their risk of early dementia, Alzheimer's, four times greater risk than a normal population. Uh, and what you can see in that particular scan, there's actually, with this person who's in their uh, late teens, early 20s, there's actually atrophy occurring in the frontal cortex, meaning it's already an aging brain. And in fact, research just came out uh, that shows that uh, high amounts of sugar do have the same impact on the brain as cocaine. Anything you put in your mouth influences your brain. Uh, balancing nutrition is so important because uh, we know right now that um, we don't think too much of, uh, like everybody knows the hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are like the three big ones that everybody out there knows about. Another hormone that's very significant is one called insulin, and that also influences brain function. Just read a research study yesterday that uh, people that have uh, uh, increased experiences and numbers of experiences of hypoglycemic episodes, where there's fluctuations of blood sugars that are going up and down, which causes higher depression, anxiety, and so on, have increased risk of dementia. Now, if that isn't fascinating, we, we just don't think of Snickers and dementia. <laughs> we don't think of cookies and dementia. We, we, don't, we don't look at that at all. But if you're a compulsive eater like myself, first off, there's never such a thing as eating one cookie or one candy bar or something like that. You eat the whole package. 
Well, that kind of binging, you know, and that kind of addiction increases the risk of early dementia, Alzheimer's. This front part of the brain right here, if it's not working right, you're gonna say things you don't wanna say, you're gonna make choices, they're gonna keep falling into the same pothole over and over and over and over again. God gave us this wonderful, wonderful brain. Uh, there's over 100 trillion different nerves, neurons with the little nerve fibers and all the connections between the other in the brain. And so when you look up at the stars at night, uh, what you'll notice and, and what you can grasp, when you look at the universe, you look at those stars, there's actually that universe in here is greater than all that universe out there. When you look at those trillions of nerves and then you look at all the interconnections between them, the universe in here is greater than the universe out there. And when you look at what God has given us, this beautiful, beautiful brain that you know is basically three pounds and it actually takes 20% of our calories each day just to take care of brain function. Take care of it. I've been working with sexual addiction. Uh, I met Dr. Patrick Carnes in 1976. And so let's just say I've had a few years in working with sexual addiction now. And when I started to look at the brain, that was when I found like a missing piece with sexual addiction. Because uh, so far with every sexual addict that we've worked with, and uh, it was male or female that we scanned, every one of them had a slight injury in the front part of the brain. And that plays a big role in impulse control. And for the sexual addicts, so many times when they're in the structure of their work or their home or their ministry, they do fine. It's just those hours uh, before work or the ministry, after work in the ministry, when they're left to themselves. And that's where that they have trouble maintaining the self-control or maintaining that self-focus, uh, um, you know, to choose differently. And every, so far in every sexual addict that we scanned over this last 12 years, uh, every one of them uh, had an area of the brain called the basal ganglia that was overacted. The basal ganglia is like an anxiety thermostat that will sets that level of anxiety and, and that influences an area of the brain called the cingulate, which is like a gear shifter in the brain. So when that anxiety center is high, it keeps that cingulate, which is like a gerbil on a wheel, continuing to run. So if they latch onto that thought of lust, whatever form that might take, whether it be pornography or prostitutes or an affair or whatever, then they lock onto it and they literally have difficulty shifting out of it. So there, to me, there's very definitely uh, some brain chemistry issues to do uh, with sexual addiction. Now what sexual addicts can do if, if uh, they have that particular pattern. I, I wrote a book called This Is Your Brain on Joy and there's a chapter on each one of these areas. Like uh, the chapter on the basal ganglia uh, actually has a checklist in it so that you know if you're having problems in that area. And that's influenced by GABA. Now there's a, neuro, uh, a supplement called GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, that can actually help calm that area down. There's medications, one of them that's very effective called gabapentin or Neurontin that is very effective in calming that area down to help people make better choices. And then to help the singular part of the brain, that uh, gear shifter, that's influenced more by serotonin. And that's where uh, medications like effects or uh, Cymbalta, Lexapro can help calm that down. But what every addict has to watch out for is, because so many times they'll be given that medication as a first line to help, but every one of like Lexapro, Cymbalta, uh, Effexor, and Prozac, each one of those are what are called stimulating antidepressants, and they have a side effect that causes that anxiety center to go up in the brain. Well, if that anxiety center goes up in the brain, what happens? Well, then they get hyper-focused in lust again because the whole purpose in acting out in lust is ultimately you know, to compulsively masturbate or do something sexual because of what an orgasm is, is this incredible pharmaceutical waterfall of, of all kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters that just completely bathe the brain, calm the basal ganglia, give a little bit of a high, and then it calms a person down for a rested state. And I can't tell you how many men I've worked with where they've 
and masturbate every night just to be able to go to sleep. Well, the goal is, is to calm that anxiety center down, whether it's through a medication like um, Neurontin, Gabapentin, or another medication like an antidepressant to help that obsessive part of the brain. Um, and then sometimes, you know, like with, you know, remember my scan, it looked like two big holes right here. We do have people, you can do those first two steps, but that's just not enough. And they might actually, like I need a stimulant to put in and that will balance the brain out. Because uh, almost every addict will have some form of almost like ADD behavior, you know, and impulsiveness, problems with attention, concentration, and so on. Uh, but if you give them a stimulant without taking care of the foundation of the brain, which is the, that anxiety center and the temporal lobes of the sides of the brain, you'll make them worse and they'll look worse. So that's why part of the reason why I wrote that book is because then people have like a road map on how to treat the brain. And that's why I love the scans because that actually gives us a picture to go by, you know, to treat the brain. Very common question is whether or not some people have to take medications an entire lifetime or uh, whether take it for a while and the brain chemistry will balance out. Well, what we found out there's basically two groups of people. Uh, if we find a protocol that's working and is helping a person stay sober in their addiction and they're making progress on that, then uh, we usually give it like a year and a half to two years, you know, and then at that year and a half to two year mark, then gradually bring down the medication. Now, if the symptoms return, say anxiety comes back or obsessiveness comes back, well, then you got an answer that's probably more genetics. And that, because uh, right now there's something like 21 different genetic markers for addictions. And so some people just are wired with a higher degree of anxiety inside. And that person, for them not to take medication, it's like telling a diabetic not to take uh, insulin or telling somebody who needs glasses, you know, not to wear glasses, you know. So we have those two groups of people. One group will go off, the brain will have recalibrated and balanced out, or maybe they're able to drop one or two of the medications and maybe only have one. And then there's another group where they probably are gonna be on some kind of maintenance um, for the rest of their life. People that are survivors of, of sexual abuse and sexual trauma and uh, physical trauma and so on, uh, they definitely it shows up on a brain scan. There's a pattern on the brain scan that's called the diamond pattern. And as you look at that scan, uh, you'll notice you know, where I have marked in like a diamond and what that says, the limbic area of the brain where emotionally charged memories is overactive. And then the basal ganglia, the anxiety center of the brain, that is overactive. And then the top of that diamond is called the anterior cingulate, which is that gear shifter. And so what we find in helping the people of, of sexual trauma is pretty much helping to balance the brain chemistry, but then also uh, being involved in therapy. Because uh, just taking a pill does not solve things, you know, and a pill or supplements will help the hardwire of, of the brain to work better, but the software is still gonna need help, whether that's therapy, support groups, prayer, all the disciplines of the faith we talked about. So that's why there's forms of therapy that are very helpful with the uh, person recovering from sexual trauma. There's uh, one therapy I use is EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. That's a very effective form and a research-based technique uh, that helps. And then there's inner child work, you know, where, it, where it's an experiential process of, of giving back the pain and the shame of the, of back to the perpetrator uh, from the person who uh, was, was impacted by the sexual abuse. And there's another form of therapy called somatic experience. is a very another very effective uh, healing form of dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, which every uh, survivor of any, of any kind of spiritual or emotional or sexual abuse will have.